Welcome back. Today I want to talk about heteroscedasticity. We will explore what it does to our regression analysis and most importantly how we can fix it. And finally I will do uh, an example in Starter and show you how to handle heteroscedasticity um, in um, a real life problem. Good, let's get started. Um, first of all, um, the main assumption we make when we run a regression um, model is that the error term in our model has a constant variance throughout all the observations. Now this assumption is quite important when it comes to calculating um, the p-values and of course all the associated statistics that are needed to derive the p-value. We focused before in um, the um, um, video on regression analysis on p-values and we know if a p-value is below 0 0.05 we can reject the null that the coefficient is equal to 0 with 95% level of confidence. Now this assessment depends crucially on the assumption that the error variance, so the variance of the error term in my model is constant is um, homoscedastic. Now very often this is not the case. To be honest in my own work I would argue that in more or less two-thirds of the cases um, heteroscedasticity, so a violation of constant variance, is the norm. So it's very very common. It happens uh, in almost all the work I do. There are many reasons why this is happening and we will talk about this over this course in, in, in more detail. But the main um, problem we have is now how can we fix it and um, what to do um, in this particular case. Number one, we have to explore our regression. So if we run a regression model, after running it we should look at our so-called residuals. We spoke about residuals before, so these are the mistakes you make while estimating a, a, a regression model. So these are these vertical deviations from the perfect line of fit, and we can obtain them using the predict command using the option res for residual. And then we can just look at these residuals um, over um, different values of my independent variable, um, and I can um, assess um, to what extent they are different um, if values um, change. Ideally, if um, homoscedasticity applies, they should be more or less um, similar in terms of uh, their variability. An easier way to spot the pattern is to take um, squared residuals. Because these squared residuals are actually um, a measure of the variance of your error term. Again, the assumption is that um, the squared residuals are constant or more or less constant with different values of your independent variable. And again, we have to, to see whether this is the case. Now, after looking at your residuals, you can do a formal test of heteroscedasticity using the so-called head test command and I will show you this in a minute. And that will tell you whether the null hypothesis that you have a constant variance throughout um, can be rejected. Again, we have to look at the p-value. If the p-value for this particular test is below 0 0.05, you can reject. And then we have to argue that um, heteroscedasticity is present which means that um, all the derived p-values in our regression model um, are suspicious. We can't trust it. Now, end of the day, um, that's what I would suggest. Look at the plot. So they should look something like this if, if you have heteroscedasticity. So usually if the variability um, is changing, and you see it's definitely changing quite substantially, this would be a strong indication of heteroscedasticity. That's another plot where we look at the squared value of a residual, which is a measure of its variance. And again, you see that variance is definitely changing for different income levels in this particular case. So here you have already very clear indication that um, heteroscedasticity is present, so we have to address it. Now, how to fix it? 
there are many different ways to, to address that. Um, the um, in textbooks usually you see the so-called weighted least squares estimation. Um, however, to be honest, in all the work I have seen in the last 20 years, whether this is consulting reports, um, research papers, almost everyone is using what is called a robust method. It's much easier to do and it works quite well. It addresses the problem um, and this is the so-called Huber White Sandwich Estimator. Yeah, so whenever you encounter this problem, I would just use the robust option and I'll show you in a minute how to do this um, and you will be reasonably fine. Good, let's um, go into starter. Just open a data set. Again, it doesn't really matter what we analyze here. So I put together some, some data using um, data from DEFRA and RPA in the UK. Um, they collect data on, on farming products. Um, so this particular data set is on, on yields in farming for different types of, of grain and milk. So it's um, it doesn't really matter. That's the beauty of what we are doing here. We can analyze anything. Yeah? And what we want to do, so our objective here is to try to predict uh, the changes um, in the oil seed yield. So if we are, for instance, running a farming business, we would like to know this. And the question is, can I use past information on other um, yields to predict um, the yield in my oil seeds? Let's see what happens. So that's the idea behind it. Um, the data again is on, on GitHub. So I now just um, move into it right away. Um, I open up a do file, what we always like to do, and I just start doing some fancy stuff above here. Um, and um, you just might make here something, um, a comment, you know, farm yields, whatever you want to call this. Um, we just copy paste that and we save it um, somewhere. I already have done, of course, all my homework. I just call this now attempt. So it's just for us now to play around. Again, it might be useful to um, change your directory. So do a change directory right at the start. And then we just do a use command here. And then we have to see the name of our data set. This is farm yields DTA. So that's our data set. We just copy paste that. Here we are. We use a comma and we use clear and we erase data in memory and we are ready to go. Let me just um, run this and see what happens. So let me just run this, head over here, um, and now it just um, restarts the data set. But it's always good to have it in the do file. It makes our life a lot easier. First thing I always like to do is to explore the data. So do a little BR, so you browse the data. So you, what you see is you have time series here. We want to focus on the oil seed. Because you have a time dimension, um, we should um, let the uh, starter know. Yeah? So I do a T set year, um, which declares that we have a time dimension. Yeah? So it's important that um, starter knows that we have a time series. I actually want to work on the changes um, of these yields. And there are reasons for this, which go beyond um, this particular lecture. So the thing I do is after T setting my data, so after starter knows it's a time series, I can now use the time series operators. Um, there is the D dot operator for the first difference. We have used this before, which is the change of the variable and the L dot operator, which is the lag. So this is a delayed, um, delayed variable. So you lag it by one time period. In our case, this would be one year. Good. First thing I do is I look at a two way chart. So I um, explore um, different relationships. I already have, of course, done this before. So I know what, what kind of should work. So I look at D dot um, oil seed. So this is the change in the oil seed yield over time. Time is in this case year. And I look at the change in, um, in this case, uh, uh, barley, which is a quite an interesting predictor um, over time. And I just run this one more time. Let me just do that. Make sure we have done this. And what you see now as output um, is quite interesting, quite useful. Let me maybe just change the color just to make it a bit bit easier to spot. So let's put in color here and make that red. 
So just using the option in one of the line charts and here we are, that's better. So what you see is that there seems to be definitely some core cool movement going on, but somehow from this period here, um, they are, seem to be a little bit out of tune. You see that in the time series, which is good for us because what we want is we want to predict. Yeah. And of course, if I'm trying to predict what's going on, uh, I can only rely on, on past information. I don't know the future, obviously. That's the idea of predicting. So I have to look at the lagged value of the change in barley to predict my oil seed yield change. Um, and that seems to be maybe working quite well because you see so to some extent it's a bit out of tune this time series. It seems to be a bit shifted. Not perfectly, of course, but to some extent. So it might be interesting to exploit that um, in a regression analysis and this is what we do next. Good, let's head over into regressions. Have some fun here and start over with a standard regression model. So we try to explain our change in the oil seed and we use um, barley for that. And we throw in here the lagged value. So we can do this L dot D dot. That works fine after T setting your data. So that will be my first regression. And then of course we can um, and we should um, try different specifications. I will do um, a special video on specifications because there is a whole um, science to this, you know, how to find the best specification. Um, but at the moment we just um, basically, um, what we do is we try simply the other variables we have in our data set and just see what, um, whether they add anything to it. So we just try this um, and we see what happens. Let me just run all of it. Here we go. So we have our output. We head back to start and now we have all these regressions. We see, looking at the first one, again, we did, of course, um, a whole um, 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 video on regressions. So all the details are there if you haven't seen that before. We see that barley has um, a predictive impact um, on my um, oil seed um, change um, of yield. Um, it's a negative one, but I can use it for prediction. The ask word is not bad, actually, so about you know, 26 percent. It's okay. You can explain a fair amount. It's not too bad. Um, if you add some some more information, so wheat, for instance, this is a borderline, so the p-value is just about 0 0.1, so only on a 90 percent level of confidence, which is already a bit on the loose end. Um, it would be significant. You see that the ask word, however, goes a little bit up. There are more things happening, of course, which we have discussed in a different um, video because uh, barley and wheat were not independent. Yeah, So there is some correlation going on and we have talked about um, multicollinearity already. Um, so that m will have an impact on the precision of your estimates. So you can't trust these p-values anyway, 100%. When we throw in the milk yield, it doesn't seem to add anything. Also, the R squared doesn't improve. You see, actually, it's going down, the adjusted R squared. And we spoke about decrease of freedom. So actually, this would indicate um, adding the milk yield is not a good idea. Adding um, the yield of wheat might be not a bad idea. Um, and this is something to explore further. Good. So we kind of have um, a little preference for this model. Again, I do something more on model specification later, where we talk um, further about the details. What I suggest to do, because now we have three different regressions models, is actually to combine them into one nice table, and I can do this in a few minutes. Let me just use the estimates store command. Um, let me just maybe zoom that a bit more. I should have done this earlier. And we do estimates store. I just give it different uh, labels, estimates store B, um, and I do estimates store C. So this is basically storing my output. Um, I don't want to see the whole output, so I use a quiet option and use a wavy bracket to basically indicate this is for me a block, um, a block of my um, code. I don't need indentation. We are not doing Python. I just like to do it because it signals to me that's a block um, of code. Yeah, this belongs together and um, it's modified by the quiet option using colon and then the wavy um, brackets. 
This suppresses the output because actually what I do now is I do estimates tables. I put the output all into one table. I refer to ABC. So I take all these stored results. I use stars to indicate significance. That's a default in many published papers. So one star refers usually to 5% level of significance or 95% level of confidence. Two stars is 1% um, level and three star is, is the 0.1% level. So it's pretty damn certain. I um, modify the output for B. B are the coefficients. So these are the slope coefficient and the constant term. And I use percent nine dot nine dot three f. It's a fixed format, so I force the output to have three decimal places for all the coefficient. And this is kind of you know standard. It's usually three or four, um, so that, that that looks quite nice. Then I add some statistics to it. I use the number of observations and then the adjusted r squared, which is r two um, underscore a, and that should do it. Let's run this one more time. Okay, it runs fine. Let's see whether we did any mistake. No, it looks good. And now we have a nice uh, table. That looks pretty nice. Yeah, so we have um, our barley, which is very significant. Down there you see um, the legend. So these are the p-values. So this is highly significant on the 99.9% .9 level of confidence. It's a good predictor. The R squared, as we saw before, is a little bit better for specification B. So that's the one I would, would select in, in spite of the fact that wheat is not significant. But we already spoke about this. This might be because of um, the correlation between barley and wheat. But in terms of prediction, that might be the better model to exploit. So we go for model B. Let's um, run model B one more time. And now what I do is I do what is called the post estimation analysis. Yeah. So now we, we look into into the plots of residuals and we see what happens. So after so after predicting the residual, um, it might be nice not to explore residuals. Um, if you have a time series problem, it's quite often useful to actually plot this over time. Um, it gives you a better indication of what is going on. Of course, over time, the value of barley and wheat, of course, will change. Yeah, but it gives you um, a better indication of um, the quality of the model. It looks, um, you know, it looks all right. Um, it, do it doesn't seem to be a massive difference in terms of variance. So it's bouncy up and down. So it it seems to be okay at, at a first glance. Sometimes it's useful, in fact, to go into the squared residual. So I use a generate command. I take the R to the power of two and do another line chart on the squared residual. This is easier to visualize um, in terms of, because that's actually a measure of variance. Yeah? So if we do this, we see that yeah, there is an indication that variance sometimes can shoot up a little bit. Yeah? End of the day, um, you have to look at um, a formal test. Yeah? So for that, we use the head test. And we run this, um, which has to be run after the regression command because it's using the stored um, results. And what you see here is that our null hypothesis is having a constant variance. Looking at the p-value, the p-value is below 0 0.05, which means that with 95% level of confidence, I can reject the null hypothesis that the variance of the error term is constant, which means I actually show heteroskedasticity is present in this case. Put differently, can I trust the p-values of my regression model? The answer is no, I can't. What do I do about it? Well, the easiest thing to do is using the robust option. Yeah. So what we do now is we just estimate this one more time using robust and uh, that is fixing it and that should be enough. Yeah. And of course, um, when you go for publication, what you actually um, do then is you do it for all your models, just throw in a robust option and you will be good. Again, it doesn't change now much. You see still um, that barley is still significant, but the p-values are slightly different. You see that slightly different, a little bit higher. Also here, a little bit higher, um, but it's it's not a not a massive difference. But still, that's the way to address heteroskedasticity. So now we have um, done it. We 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 look for it. We can able we are able to identify it, and we are able to fix it.
good. I see you in.